We begin this year's Lenten study with reading Daniel chapter 3 in the past two weeks. We learned about three Jewish young people, about 15 to 17 years old, we would say. They were being exiled to Babylon. They were framed for not worshiping the king's golden statue and were bound up and thrown into the burning fiery furnace. However, in the fire, among that flames, a fourth figure appeared, walking together with them in the midst of the fire, such that the fire did not hurt them, their hair was not singed, their clothes were not burned, and there was even no smell of fire in their bodies when they came out. Today, I want to tell you about another teenager. Um, How many of you among here are younger than 16 years old? Other than the children. Well, okay. Ah, there is one. Hmm. Important, important. So, except uh, Zach, uh, uh, no, Josh. (laughs) Josh there. Um, Most of you, are older than this young person. So this young person, when he was 16 years old, he was drafted into the German army fighting the Second World War for Nazi Germany. Later, he was sent to the front lines, but in those days, the German troops were also were already suffering great setback. And together with others, this young person Um, surrendered to the Allied forces. In the following years, he was kept uh, as a prisoner of war, and so he was sent to one camp to another, and he was in the prisoners of war camp from 1945 to 1948. In these years, he thought back about the war and what it did to him and to the world. This German youth experienced the horror of war firsthand because a friend standing just next to him was killed in the war field. Later, he learned about the extermination camps and the Holocaust under the Nazi. He was so ashamed of these acts of evil by his own country. He felt so depressed that he wished he were dead, like the other soldiers. In the prisoners of war camp, an American army chaplain gave him a Bible to read. He started to read. In the Bible, he saw that God himself suffered, even died a violent death on the cross. And at age 22, this young man was released, and he started to study theology, later became a pastor, also became a well-known German theologian. He is still alive today at the age of 98. His name is Moltmann. His famous writings include Theology of Hope, um, 1964, and The Crucified God, in 1972. He teaches that the Bible reveals to us a suffering God who suffers with us and who is our hope. Another Japanese pastor and theologian also faced the death and destruction of the Second World War in Asia. He struggled deeply how the biblical faith could respond to the tremendous human suffering. He read Jeremiah 31, verse 20, and saw that God also experienced great pain because he loved us so much, even though we rebelled against him. So in 1946, he was an older man, he wrote his important book, Theology of the Pain of God. He teaches that on the cross that Jesus died, both love and pain were manifested at the same time. 
In fact, it should not surprise us that thinkers, philosophers, whether in ancient days or in modern times, have talked a lot about the problem of suffering. And of course, they link it together as suffering and evil, because this is the reality of human existence. Even when we face pain and suffering, we often ask, why? Why me? Or where? Where is God? Because we want to know the meaning and value of life. The Bible we read is exactly the book about the meaning and value of human life. It is not a book written by philosophers or human thinkers thinking from the human perspective. It is God's revelation. That is, God telling the story of how human beings relate to him and respond to him in times past, in times present, and in times future. And for sure, the matter of human suffering can be found in the Old Testament and the New Testament all through the Bible. You just have to read carefully. The theme for our Lenten study this year is God walking with us through pain and suffering. Today's topic is the suffering God. We will read from the Old Testament. But the first reaction you may have, or what most people say, is, oh, the God of the Old Testament is a harsh and stern judge. Does he suffer? Does he feel pain? Or does he have a soft spot for his creation? Today, we will just look at one passage from the prophet Hosea, chapter 11, verses 1 to 11, because it is a compact passage that tells us a lot about God. You have to remember that in the Old Testament, a prophet is a messenger of God. They speak what God tells them to say. They have to say nothing more, nothing less. And of course, what they proclaimed have to be understood in the historical context. Briefly said, Prophet Hosea delivered God's message mainly to the northern kingdom of Israel in the 8th century BC, around 30 to 40 years before the destruction of Israel by Assyria. In those days, life was going on as usual for the Israelites. Social problems, and injustices were still a common scene. The king continued to reclaim lost territories to stabilize his power domestically and internationally. When you think about it, it is much like our life, day-to-day -to -day life today. After days of busy school and work, we come to church on Sunday as usual, in the news, you may have heard, hear about um, talks uh, about increasing the minimum wage in BC, good to someone, somebody, or may not be good to the others. And on the other side of the globe, intense bombing in the wars continue. This is what we see on the human level. This is the reality we are living in. However, the prophet Hosea reveals to us another reality. He opens a window for us. He invites us into the realm of God to have a glimpse of what is on God's heart. So, please turn with me to the Old Testament. Prophet Hosea, chapter 11 on page 902 in the ESV Bible. Let us first read verses 1 to 4. When Israel was a child, I loved him. I remembered the covenant I made with their forefather Abraham. I heard the people cry for rescue from slavery under Egypt. 
So I delivered them, made a covenant with them, and they become my son. However, in freedom, in the land of milk and honey, the more they were called, the more they went away. They did not listen to me or obey my commandments. They kept worshipping the many gods and idols of the Canaanites. They were not faithful to the one true God. Yet, it was I who held their hand and taught them to stand and walk. It was I who nursed them and healed them when they were sick. But they put me out of their mind. In fact, all the time I guided them and provided for their needs. These verses tell us about the story of their history, which is recorded in the Old Testament books from Exodus down to 1 Kings and 2 Kings. However, these verses bring to mind some old movies of the 60s and the 70s. Well, of course, that's, those are the movies that I watch. A poor mother worked as a domestic worker to earn a living to raise her son, giving him a good education and a good prospect. Then the son had a a good career and became successful. He moved to a new house, bought a new car. One day, the aging mother came to see her son. He was just about to go out with a wealthy girlfriend, and he turned to his girlfriend and said, Oh, never mind her. She's just my old housemate. But... God is the Lord of the covenant. Now, the Israel people broke the covenant, rebelled against their God. Consequently, they had to face judgment and punishment. So in verses 5 to 7, God warned them of the coming destruction by Assyria. Yet, surprisingly, Verses, nine to, verses 8 and 9 bring us into the heart of God. Read again. But note that Ephraim is the largest tribe in the northern kingdom. And this name is often used interchangeably for Israel. Adma and Zeboam are cities that were destroyed together with Sodom and Gomorrah from the fire from heaven. Also note that there is a change of pronouns in these verses. The pronoun you is used here. God is speaking directly to the Israel people. And when you meditate on the vocabulary used here, They are intensely emotionally loaded. There are words like burning anger, wrath, destroy. And there are four, how can I, how can I? And then you read, my heart recoils within me. Recoils is a strong word. It bounces back, something that bounces back. And my compassion grows warm and tender. The temperature's rising like a fire burning. These words describe to us the strong upheaval of two almost contradicting roles. On the one side is the just judge over convicted felons. On the other side is the heartbroken grief-stricken father for his beloved son. I read a book. The title is Parents in Pain, written by a counselor sharing his true story and many other parents' stories of pain they experienced when their son or daughter had fallen astray. One parent was heartbroken 
when he learned that his unmarried daughter got pregnant. Another parent felt like she almost died when she had to phone the police to turn her son in because he committed a crime. Indeed, God suffers with us. He is in pain and he grieves over us. Yet, God promises to bring back the Israel people from exile in verses 10 and 11, and he will restore them. Why? Not because they are doing good, but because they cry out to him. And it is based on who God is in verse 9b. Look at that. Verse 9b. Yahweh said, I am God, not a man. I am the Holy One in your midst. Meaning that he is the Lord God of his people. He is the Holy One of Israel. He will stay faithful to his covenant. He will deal with his people in grace and mercy. In the beginning of the sermon, I mentioned the German and Japanese pastor and theologian. The Japanese theologian wrote his theology of the pain of God based on Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 20. And I read to you. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is, my darling, is he my darling child? For as often as I speak against him, I do remember him still. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him, declares the Lord. It is in the suffering of God that people find love and hope, in, even in the face of extreme suffering, such as in the Second World War. In closing, I want to share with you a testimony of Elsa's father, Mr. Wong. Mr. Wong has, had always had good health, but was suddenly diagnosed with terminal cancer. During the th few months he was hospitalized in Mount St. Joseph Hospital, Bishop Stephen, still Reverend Leung then, visited him regularly. Mr. Wong was very unhappy and did not speak much. Since he had to lie in bed all the time, he had lots of time looking ahead at the crucifix hanging on the wall because Mount St. Joseph Hospital in, is still a, a Catholic background and so they would put crucifix in the rooms. One day he talked to Reverend Leon and said, that he believed Jesus understood his pain and suffering. When Reverend Leung shared the gospel with him, he gladly received Jesus and was baptized in the hospital bed with family members sharing his joy. And he smiled greatly in the baptism. Shortly after, he rested in peace and returned to Jesus Christ, his Lord and Savior. Dear brothers and sisters, the God, the suffering God in the Old Testament, in the New Testament is not someone far away from us, distant from us. Have you asked yourself, is your relationship with God just a habit, um, an external formality? You come, sit through a Sunday service, or you encounter God, encounter your God, encounter our God, encounter the God of the whole world in every aspect of your life, in good days and in bad days. Does the suffering God become your hope and your love? May God help us in Lent to see him and to know him more clearly and follow him 
more closely. Amen.